this code is such a mess. Just stop. What what are you guys why? Stop it. No, what why what are you you're out of control. Just stop. Today we're going to talk about marker nodons because the game does a great job of not showing them in the main tutorials at all. And if you read the documentation on them, it's basically useless. And that's a shame because they really help you save a lot of nodons and make your code a lot less spaghetti. Marker nodons have a lot of uses for music, animation, power-up systems, and for health bars, just to name a few. So today I'm going to be talking about how marker nodons work and how to use them effectively in your levels. When it comes to marker nodons, the first thing you have to understand is that they do not behave anything like the other nodons in the game. Markers behave like an output type, but they don't really connect to any objects in the world, so it's a little bit less clear as to how to actually use them without experimenting thoroughly. There are three main marker types, a continuous display marker, a 1D marker, and a 2D marker. A continuous marker display nodon just always has this light blue square in it. A 1D marker nodon has this little blue square in it that moves around depending on what value you pass into it. And a 2D marker nodon has this little blue circle that moves around to different coordinates depending on what values are passing the X and the Y. So you might wonder, how do you use them? By themselves, they're pretty useless because you're just moving a little blue picture around the map. This is where a bullseye nodon comes in. A bullseye nodon's job is to measure how much blue is inside of it. So if the bullseye is over here without a blue marker, it will pass a zero. But if I move the bullseye over here, you notice that the number value that it's passing becomes larger as there's more blue in the circle and less as there's less blue in the circle. This is one thing that separates markers and bullseyes from other types of nodons. What they do depends on exactly where you place them in the code. A counter nodon does the same thing no matter where you place it because it's connected to an input and output port. However, a bullseye nodon's function changes dramatically on how you place it relative to a marker. A 2D marker nodon also counts as a detector, as this light blue circle will also trigger a bullseye, but will also have its own output if this blue circle gets covered by another marker nodon. Here, the entire 2D marker outputs a 1. You get a similar effect if you cover it with any sort of marker as well. This has a huge number of use cases that I'll get to later, but first let's focus on the different options that these nodons have. A continuous display marker has no options except turning it off. Making it bullseye incompatible makes it completely useless. A bullseye nodon has some basic features for how it detects. First, you can change a bullseye between detecting a small circular area inside of it versus a full rectangle, the entire size of the nodon itself. You also have some basic digital and analog options. In analog mode, a bullseye will give you more signal depending on how much of it is covered by marker. In digital mode, the bullseye will give you no signal if it's below a certain area coverage, and it will give you a signal of one when it's above that threshold. So here, we have either no signal or a signal of one, respectively. In my code, I'll almost always set bullseyes to rectangular, digital, and having a very low threshold value. That way, the bullseye just tells me zero or one, is there a marker on top of it? 1D marker nodons take in a single value and then give you a different type of moving shape that depends on its settings. 1D marker with move will have this small blue square moving on a range between zero and one. Line is the same thing but thinner. Extend will fill the bar at least that much. Rotate will spin the shape at an angle and a pie chart is self-explanatory. Opacity makes the marker turn more or less blue and flash will alternate how blue it gets up to a maximum value dictated by what you're putting in. However, the developers really dropped the ball on this one because as long as the marker has any opacity whatsoever, it'll give you the exact same amount of signal to a bullseye node on. Since there's not really a way to check for different opacities, the opacity and flash filters don't really do anything. Lastly, the 2D marker node on has a feature for size, which determines how big the circle is, as well as similar digital and analog functions for how much of a value it outputs when something covers it. Since it's not obvious how to use them, first I'll give you some examples. Marker nodons are best when you want one number to control multiple different events or be a trigger for many different potential things happening depending on its value. Let's start with a very, very simple example. Let's say that I have yellow person over here and I want this apple to be a power up for him. So when he collects the apple, now he turns pink. The easiest way to do this is to increment this counter whenever an apple is collected slash broken. So when this counter is equal to zero, then make the person yellow. And when this counter has one collected apple, 
then make the person pink. This is simple enough, but what if I want to go from a pale yellow starting character to a super pink up to K.O. Ken Red, Ultra Instinct Blue, and Super Saiyan God Green? So that's pretty simple, right? You just add more statements. If the counter is zero, make it yellow. If one, make it pink. If two, go red, etc. But you're seeing that this code becomes messier and more spaghetti-like every time we go on. There's a much easier way to keep everything structured with a marker node on because all these different states are controlled by just one number, the number of apples that we have collected. What I can do is have the counter for how many apples have been collected and map that zero to four to zero to one for the marker node on. And whenever an apple is collected, that blue marker moves. And when that blue marker moves, then it activates a different texture. It tells you which state that you want to activate. By using the marker in bullseyes, we can easily get the player to the right power-up state or the right state in the level, depending on what the value is of that counter. So here's what that code looks like in action. You might say, Luke, you only saved three nodons, and I don't really see that this is such a big deal. All right, let me show you what the problem is. As our person is of Saiyan descent, I don't want him to be yellow all the time. That costs a lot of energy. So I want him to be able to press the button to go super yellow. So instead of Mario throwing fireballs or a launcher when he gets powered up, now he just turns yellow. And when our person grabs this apple power up, now he becomes more powerful. And instead of going super yellow, he becomes ultra pink. In practice, this would be throwing a punch or fireballs, but you know, turning ultra pink is cool too. So how do we do this? Well, count number of apples. If we have zero apples and we press the A button, then turn yellow. And if we have one apple and we press the A button, now it goes pink. But again, let's scale up the power up system. Here I can go super yellow, ultra pink, KO Ken red, ultra instinct blue, and super saiyan god green. And now you see that this is getting very messy and very expensive very quickly. This is when our friend 2D Markerson comes to save the day. For this logic, I have an outcome that depends on two variables. The variable of how many apples have been collected and whether or not I'm pressing the A button. So first, I'm going to map the values of both variables so they're in the zero to one range. Now the Y position is controlled by a number of apples. So whenever you collect an apple, the marker is moved to a different Y position, a different rung of the power scale. And then when you press the A button, you are put to activate the relevant texture, which again could be a fireball or a launcher or whatever. This way, you have the exact same game logic. The difference is that now it's much more tidy. It's also much cheaper because this costs 23 nodons and this will cost 15 nodons. But let's change to an experience-based system. Let's say I can currently turn super yellow and my first apple allows me to unlock ultra pink. But now after I consume a couple more apples, I don't quite have enough experience yet. But when I have my last, now I have an, an epiphany so I can go super saiyan god green. If you try to do this with comparison statements, you'll quickly find yourself with a mess of different inequalities, ifs, ands, and nots. But this is no problem for 2D marker node on because you just change the size of the bullseye so that whenever I've collected one to three apples, now I can go ultra pink because the region of the bullseye covers that range. I've been focusing on power systems because it's pretty intuitive for my audience, but there's a lot more you can do with, with markers. At the end of the day, markers are all about checking if a variable is in a certain range of values. In programming, this is the difference between an if statement and a switch statement. Logic nodons, like and in comparison, are like if statements, where if the conditions are satisfied on the inputs, then output a one. So these two nodons only have one case built in. Marker bullseyes are more like switch case blocks, where one variable goes in, it can have multiple values, and depending on which value it is, will be which statement, which bullseye gets activated and then triggers its own set of events. Here, for instance, I can make it so that this will activate only if you've pressed the L bumper at least twice, but not more than five times to then activate with that continuous marker node on. Because if you press any more, then it's out of range. For 2D markers, it's all about checking different combinations of values. You can do a very similar thing with bullseye nodons. Here, this is rigged to do something different depending on if I press Y, if I press B, or if I press both Y and B. 2D marker nodons are also useful for plotting values when you're not exactly sure what's going on. By using bullseyes and markers, it's very easy to schedule different 
textures or different sounds in order to play a different animation cycle or to play music. You can also use different ranges to activate looping sound effects for different amounts of time. The different modes of a 1D marker node on allow you to do some different comparisons. While move and line are best for checking if your variable is equal to a certain value, extend is better when you need to check when a value is at least or at most. So let's say I have an experience system. Let's say I'm allowing you to buy power-up number one if you have at least 20 experience points. And if you have at least 60 experience points, then you can also buy power-up number two. But that also allows you to still buy power-up number one. This allows you to do something like a skill tree or just check if a value is at least some number. Rotate is very good for checking when you have different values of angles, which is good when you have like an animation that depends on which way you're facing. You can also use a 2D marker in combination with an angle to position node on in order to basically check what angle a character is facing by activating different bullseyes depending on the angle. Here's what that code looks like in a base case. And so now you see that when this character moves around the in-game world, now the texture that I'm showing changes. So now I can have an animated character with a different facing direction. And here's sample music that will play an entire Daft Punk song with only 135 nodons. I can't share due to copyright and personal reasons, but the point is that you can use marker nodons to schedule a full length song without costing very many nodons. Since markers and bullseyes really depend on where you place them on the editor, I do recommend you lock them so you don't accidentally shuffle them around. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope to see you using markers in your own levels to make some masterpieces. And with that, that's all I have for you today, guys. I'll see you around. Later!